Welcome to the Body Aware Living Podcast. I'm Margot Rose, and I'm the author of Body Aware Grieving, a fitness trainer's guide to caring for your health during sad times. And we're here together to explore, to talk to wise and kind people from around the world, and we're finding practical ways to get through difficult times and to celebrate our accomplishments. And I'm here today with one of my favorite, favorite people in the world. Um, Mayor Wisotsky is 89 years old, and he and my father were best friends from the time they were 18 years old and going to college. And um, very sadly, my father passed away about 17 years ago. And uh, so Mayor is somebody I've known more than my whole life. And uh, visiting with him here and getting this incredible wisdom from him is, is really special. So I just want to say hi really quick. Um, so Meyer has written a book of poetry, and it's called The Legend of the Twilight Owls, a book of poetry for the searching and the perplexed. And he's always given such great advice, so I wanted to connect and, and have him share with you a little bit together today. Thank you. Um, there was so many jobs that you mentioned that you've done in the back of the book. I wanted to just mention them quickly, and then we can, you were, it says in the back of your book you were a factory worker. A hospital executive, I've got my cheat sheet, factory worker, hospital executive, a teacher, a counselor, an actor, a director, a writer, a musician, a salesman, an entrepreneur, a manager, a bricklayer, you were a soldier in the Korean War, and you were a paperboy. <laughs> <laughs> so you really, a lot of jobs. A lot, you can really do a lot at 89 years when, yeah, you, put, when you put your true. mind to it. Yeah, I, I think one of the aspects of living as long as I've lived is that you start to think about what am I going to be leaving? Because obviously, uh, you know, I've done a lot in my life. And so one of my goals has been to see if I can pass on all of the understanding and the lessons that I have learned about life to anybody who could use them. Because I really feel a sense of connection with uh human beings and with people who uh, are going through the same thing as I went through. And uh, I can tell you from experience that I've made every mistake you could almost make, <laughs> but I, uh, I still f feel that that has not been a bad thing. It's been an interesting and a learning thing for me. That makes a lot of sense. You've also done a lot of things right in your life, and including I want to get to talking about some of your romance advice because uh, you're you've been with your current wife Mariel, who's done this incredible artwork in all of your uh, projects, including this book. And you guys have been together how many years now? Forty-three years. Forty-three years. Right. I know when I've needed romance advice, you've always given great <laughs> suggestions and great advice. Well, let's get straight into that. Why don't we start with where we are? So okay. what what are some of the key things, just really the nuggets of what you think people who want to build good relationships, love-based relationships, including romance, but not necessarily only romance, what's, what's like your nugget of truth that you think people could learn from? Basically, I believe that people have to be willing to share their essence those secrets that they've kept all their life that could have been from when they were a child and they're not telling anybody any of this and suddenly they get an opportunity to be in love with someone and and the loving demands that they give them this uh, inside information and i think that's where people get fouled up is because if they don't give them this kind of full essence knowledge of, of them they don't have the, the relationship that they want they're not they're not with their soulmate they're just with another person so some of sharing parts of yourself that are very very um that, that the deep deep intimacy is going to come from that courage right of sharing parts of yourself even if it's the parts that you you for whatever reason don't normally share with exactly and this is the person who no matter what you tell them will accept it as as part of your life. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to judge you on it. I'm not going to condemn you for it. I'm going to just absorb it as that's what you went through before because now you have changed. You've met me, and now we can make our lives together. And that's the way I've been relating to my wife for the last 43 years. <laughs> well, if it's been working for 43 years. You guys do have a very sweet relationship. I appreciate that so much. And 
and again, having known your having known your wife for all these years, 43 years, most of my life, I, I wanted to touch on this idea that I feel when I'm with you and you know so much about our family, this idea of like chosen family and the idea that you can really pick who you want to be intimate with, not just in romance, not just in friendships. You can sort of, some people don't have, some people still have a birth family, that family they were born with, and those people are great, they get along. Other people, you know, never got along that well or felt supported by their birth family. And, and then there's other people that had a birth family, but they're, they're not close now through um, having lived in different locations or, or people pass away. Right. But the idea of like, you, you, you've said to me sometimes like, oh, I, I see you like a daughter. Right. And I see you like an uncle. And this idea that you can choose who you want as your group of people. And the thing is that we tend to use the birth model as a model that we talk about. Like, I see you as an uncle. Mm -hmm. You don't have to see me as an uncle. You can see me as a person who, who is who he is. And that's, and that's a hard one because the nice thing about picking the people that you yeah. want to relate to doesn't have to be the same model as what the family is, but even a higher model in terms of now I'm picking someone who I personally have all this understanding and respect and relating to, and it's all just us together. It doesn't matter if we, you know, there's relationships that are, you know, birth relationships or not. And so I we, think that that's one of the important aspects. So we don't even have to, these super important people that we can choose in our lives and choose to share intimacy with, whether or not we're lovers specifically, it's just that, that, that um, we don't even have to model a traditional nuclear birth family exactly. to consider that a valuable, valuable relationship. It's like uh, everybody wants to be like something else. Well, meaning that you take something else as the standard. Uh -huh. And I don't think you have to do that with friendship and with love. I think that can be totally in, uh, you know, you can even love things in that, in that same manner. That you're, you're expressing some kind of understanding with what this thing or this person is. And then you're taking that into your inner self and having it as part of you. I like to think of the real family of people that you live with, but people that you respect and people that you are now sharing. And that's the key is that you're sharing your life with them, which makes that your life much more uh, relevant and much more sacred. Yeah. I mean, I agree with everything you're saying and <laughs> I've always appreciated it. And um, we were connecting yesterday and you, you said something that just blew my mind and I wanted to include it in today's discussion with, with people. I went through one of the really hardest times in my life and uh, you were there in person experiencing me and I have no recollection of this moment. One of the absolute worst traumas of my life was... Um, and just for people that are specifically triggered around the topic of suicide, just to let you know that is that is part of this topic that we're going to mention right now. But I, uh, I had a romantic partner um, pass away, die by suicide during a really hard time because we were we were uh, about to move together to go take care of my mother who had cancer that turned out to be eventually terminal. So my mother's sick with cancer. I'm about to move from one state to another state to go help take care of her. And the person who I was in love with and about to be partnered with and about to go move with died by suicide the week that we were leaving, so theoretically together. And my dad came up to visit me uh, right after that happened, and and I did not know this, but you came to visit me, but my dad had told you not to discuss this experience that I had just been through. So you were, can you just well, tell me what my dad told you? I mean, that's just yeah, incredible. It's just, it's just that she, he told me that you, what had happened, and that everything was still a mystery about what was going on. Nobody knew exactly. Yeah. And he said, don't mention this to her because he knew that you were very upset. And 
so I went over and was talking to you and was relating to you, and uh, the, the issue never came up other than the statement that he was dead and that you were not going to be moving with him. That was it, but, but beyond that, it was we were just talking about what was happening to us at the time, getting coffee, you know, just talking, and uh, this is something that you didn't remember at all. I was completely, this is sort of the essence, I'm going to take this off. This was sort of the essence of body aware grieving. This is where body aware grieving started. The fact that I could be functioning, you were saying, oh, you went and got us a cappuccino and you came, I just, <laughs> the fact that I was functioning that week um, when I'd been so, so, so traumatized and it's just a complete disconnect between what was really happening and what I was doing to function. So I'm, I'm glad that I could be functional because I survived that experience. I unpacked, I packed up an apartment. I rented a rental truck. I'd never driven a rental truck. I drove to a different state. I mean, I did all these things in a, in a haze. Right. When you, you said, what did you say? You said I was really like checked out? What did, yes. How did you describe myself? Like uh, I, I think you 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 were in a different plane, a different aspect of reality, and you were not going to deal with the other part of what was happening to you. This is not uncommon for people who have real traumatic experiences. And I remember my granddaughter had a similar situation when she was uh, somewhere around eight or nine. She came to stay with me. I was living in uh, Oregon at the time. And she stayed for a couple of weeks, and then I sent her back. As she grew up, later on, after she was an adult, I asked her about it. She didn't remember anything at all about that time. My daughter, granddaughter went through some rough times because my daughter was uh, had a lot of problems. But the thing was, that was an era that she didn't want to remember at all from the day-to-day -day reality, and she had made up some other kind of reality for it. I think that's very common with people who have problems that they can't solve. When you can't solve a problem, what do you do? Well, I just forget that the problem exists, and bingo, I can still function. I well, think that, the body does that. The, yeah, I mean, the fact that we can shut down such enormous parts of our brain and get through hard times is, is on the one hand, sometimes convenient and necessary and a survival right. tool, but, I mean, that's the, the sort of complete core essence. I, I invented this whole concept of body aware grieving at that moment during that experience. I mean, actually, while we're here, let me just tell this story really quickly. Um, I, as I was unpacking that, you know, rental vehicle with everything that I'd brought, I didn't know where to go and stay because whatever, too many details. But when I, I was, I had this um, huge package of saran wrap, this big restaurant sized thing of saran wrap, because I was wrapping up some things to store and this big piece of this big roll of saran wrap with the metal edges fell off of what I was um, off of this thing I was trying to use and it it ended up slicing about half an inch on my wrist and so I looked down at my wrist and my wrist was bleeding and I was like I realized I'd been in such a daze even though I was functional I was not functional enough to the point where now I had my wrist was bleeding and it was right next to my vein and I just was like, stop, stop. I was like, no matter what I'm going through, if I'm not paying more attention than this to what my body's actually doing, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm in danger. And my first question to myself was, well, is it my intention to survive this? And I, I realized it was, it was just a hard time, but I, I, I had every desire to just get through to the better times. but. That was the moment when I was like, oh, body aware grieving that I have to keep track of what I'm doing physically, no matter what I'm going through emotionally, yes. and that I can't have that disconnect where, anyhow, that, that, that's really the core moment. And I didn't realize that, anyhow, that's just part of our history. And I, and when you mentioned that yesterday, I was just, yeah. I was just shocked that, that, um, well, as we were talking about yesterday also is the body is and the mind are not joined all the time apparently yeah <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the mind seems to have the ability to manipulate reality where the body is mm. always tells the truth 
The body always tells the truth. That has to be one of our shareable quotes from yes. this interview. Absolutely. The body always tells the truth. That's beautiful. And uh, and I think that's what that's what, what was happening at that time. And I, I, I can imagine in my own life many times when that was the case. And I had to start thinking. Uh, I remember I, with a hammer, I missed. The, when I was hitting and I hit my hand and I immediately went into a shock and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just said, hit your hand. It wasn't like, you know, it hurt, but but it, but I didn't have to go into shock on it. And in my mind actually told the body, cool down. You know, you're not, you're not hurt that bad. Take it easy. And the reality was that uh, it finally, the mind and the body were working together and I didn't go into shock, I didn't faint, I didn't, you know, everything worked out okay. So I think there is a uh, a process that the body, you know, just tells what it's, what's happening, but the mind makes up stories about it, you know. <laughs> the mind seems to embellish it with uh, whatever they think should be embellished. Well, that's, that's part of what we're exploring here uh, with the whole body we're living idea is is just exploring what we have influence over right and um who we have influence over of wanting to be near and ha having influence over ourselves between the mind and the body and how to make sure there's not such a big disconnect that you're you know functioning without awareness and how to get the support team of people around you that you right. have power over the support team of people that you're choosing and I know I know a half hour is going to go through really go go by really really quick and we like to try to keep these to half hour but I had a, also a really special experience with your book I I um I have a friend anyhow I have a friend who I read one of your poems to yeah. that it just touched him so deeply I have this friend I've known since high school and he had experienced something so so hard where after a, a breakup of his marriage his his, his ex found sort of a way to make sure that the children didn't want to visit with him. She, even though he'd been close to his kids in the divorce, um, anyhow, he ended up not being close to his children and not being part of his children growing up because of something that happened as a fallout from this divorce. And right. I never knew what to say to him because that seemed like such an inconceivable suffering to not raise your own children who you love and know you're not getting that time back. It just seemed like one of the worst things that a person could yeah. go through. So I I was reading your book. One of those poems says exactly that topic. And I, anyhow, if you want to, I read him this poem. If you want to share this I poem. I will certainly share this one. Let me get my glasses here. Because I had gone through a similar, very bad divorce and uh, with two sons. Mm. The name of this poem is Two Sons. I have two sons who don't talk to me because their pain is deeper than their understanding. They were pawns in a marital chess game, sacrificed to pr protect a queen or, or, or a, a king. Now they wander in a world of misunderstanding, unable to heal the sorrow, unable to enjoy the belonging that they long for, unable to know their place as adults in an adult world. How can I help them? How can I try if, if in their eyes I am the reason for their discontent? I have two sons, but they don't have me. That, that line, I have two sons, but they don't have me, it just went straight to my heart, even though I've experienced no version of anything similar, but it made me think of this friend. And I, I said, hey, it's a really tender topic, but can I send you a copy of this poem? And, and he, he felt really uplifted by that. He felt an empathy that he wasn't alone in his experience. And I just, I just think that that's really the magic of art. I think the magic of whatever kind of art is that it can it can go through and and show so much support and love. It can make us not go crazy. It can make us not feel crazy. We can express sort of a love and an intimacy through 
art, music, drama, photography, poetry. And I just really wanted to let you know that 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 you helped that man that day a mm. lot. And wow, glad to see yeah, that. And yeah, and you and you helped me because I didn't know what to say that would you know, you always right. take a chance when you're I didn't know how he was gonna respond, if it was gonna make him feel worse. Who knew what he was doing that day? He might have been having a great day, and then here's this poem about this worst experience of his life, one of the worst yeah. experiences of his life. But he he felt very, very um not alone. Good, good, yeah. because that was the intent of my right when I wrote this book after I've been writing poems for many, many years. I was, what I was trying to do was to say, people, I have gone through some of this stuff. I can give you some uh, help in terms of your own life because it's all all of us are going through the same kinds of things. And uh, if anyone is interested, by the way, I uh, I write at least three poems a week, and I wake. I send out my weekly poems, mm -hmm. and if you would like to join that, I'd be more than happy to put you on my list, and you could get that that kind of uh, understanding of the world uh, through my poetry, I, or you could even get this book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a we'll have a link to the book for sure, because I I know I really enjoyed it, and I enjoy all the artwork that your wife designed. But it's true, you have this email list where every week. You just you send out these poems to your friends. You're just you're just maybe this is also part of being 89 years old. <laughs> is yeah. that you're really making sure there's there's poems from decades and you 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 send out three poems a week. And what is the main reason you do that? What's the main pleasure you get from that? Well, the the thing is that as as the book is described, it it it's my life and my understanding and how I solve the problems of living as long as I lived. It's not an easy task to mm -hmm. live all these years and have all those things happen to you and still you end up realizing that this is the only life I had to live and I got to live it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, uh, when I when I came to the point where I realized I was getting close to death because at 89 years old, you're not going to live too much longer. I'd like to live a Longer, but <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, but the reality is, you can you can actually do something, and that something is what I did. I I, I took uh, my understanding and I said I'm going to put this out there for people to see it, and if they can help them, I feel it's like you you planted a tree, you left something, and it would last for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, well that's that's what it's like to get a little email from you every week and um sometimes I I just save those I save those emails to where I, where I can really it's a busy week and I don't I don't like open them up until I have time to think and be peaceful and concentrate like I you know I guess that's kind of what it's like for art sometimes it can sort of take you out of the sort of bric-a-brac of daily thought exactly. and and you want to give it some moment where you're like this is this is beautiful. This moment's beautiful, and I want to pay attention to it. I don't want that out of body. I'm here, but my function is here. I don't want to read something while I'm chattering away mentally about right. whatever was going on. So, like, I, I really that's how I treat that uh, that email and those those poems. I I wait until I really am ready to just sink in, and they're short, and so I can just sink in and spend a few minutes and appreciate Good. your wisdom when I can't talk to you directly and um. Well, let's, what is one wish that you have for our, you know, body where living people? What's, what's one wish or piece of advice that you want to share with them? Well, I, I think that uh, everyone has the obligation to try to survive. This is the key to reality. It, you were, no one asked to be born. No one understood, you know, what was going to happen to them once they got born. Yet in the end result is you become responsible for your life, whether you had, you know, were asked to give it or not. Mm -hmm. And so I think the one thing I could say to you, to everyone out there is become the expert of your life by seeing how you connect to all the other people in the world, how you connect to other people who are having similar uh, experiences. And in that way, you can have a sense of being part of something so much bigger than you. And I think that is that is 
the kind of thing that keeps you understanding why survival is so important. Mm -hmm. So, so as part of what you're saying that no matter what you're going through, there's a community for you. Absolutely. No matter what you're going through, no matter which favorite thing you love doing, whether it's your favorite hobby and your favorite joyful moment or your favorite kind of uh, arts that you like doing, there's a community for you. And if you've been through what you think is an inconceivable loss that nobody else could possibly understand, there's actually a community for you too. No question about it. You yeah. hit it right on the head. That's the place that you want to be, yeah. where you know that there are other people who you can share with who understand. And that's the key. Unless you've gone through this, you don't understand it. And that's what you got to keep in mind. And you got to look for them. This, it doesn't come easy. You got to say, I got to search for these folks if I can't, you know, if I can't find them readily and then see what I can get. And I, I think that what you asked me before about what is it that that you can do that makes you understand that someone else understands you is you can give them something of your insides, of your essence, and see how they react to it. And if they just brush it off and say, this is ridiculous, you'll know that's not a person that you're going to be relating to. Mm -hmm. And if someone says, I understand that, and good gives you something back of them, mm -hmm. you are now in this process of sharing lives that you would never have shared if you were just alone. Yeah. Um, I think all that is just super powerful. I yeah. think people aren't going to feel... People are going to feel like no matter what they're going through, no matter what they've been through, no matter what they want, no matter what they like, no matter where they are, especially now we have so much... The internet just opens everything up, and the past couple years, everyone's gotten better at the internet. And so no matter what everybody can find people who are going to be um making their life richer and no matter what they always have something to offer other people who right. want to know them they want to see them they want to um everybody's going to know but everybody wants what you have to offer i mean everybody has something to offer and there's somebody who wants what you have to offer whatever that is and no matter who you like no matter who you are and no matter who you like being around um even if it's a few people, a few special, special people, like the introverted people, like I've gotten more introverted actually these past couple of years. And <laughs> as I've gotten older, I've surprised myself. But the, the, whether you want a few people that you get really, really, really close to, or whether you want um, some people, maybe more, we would call them extroverted, like having lots of people they know at least a little bit of. But there's always, there's always a way for each of us to get what we want in a way of being connected, even if it even especially the moments when it doesn't seem like it's possible it's still possible and um so i i, I knew half an hour was going to go by super quick and here we are <laughs> uh so we're going to have everything that everything about your book will be in the show notes people what's the email address and we'll put this in the show notes but people okay. can email you and just for free just like me you can be part of mayor's family <laughs> right. if, you want to, if you want to be part of mayor's family <laughs> right you can just um get be on his weekly email list right um, it's how... uh if you get it if you're ready here it is <laughs> got your pencil handy <laughs> pencil <laughs> pen pencil anything uh there's probably people under 30 who don't even know what a pencil <laughs> is they're probably just like uh, is there an app for that? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Get your pencil ready. <laughs> well, in the old days, we had symbols. We had symbols that meant something like a pencil. I'm sorry. Okay. So, okay. so get your pencil ready. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Wise Wood Carver. That's me. Wise Wood Carver at gmail.com. All right. Well, we'll have. And make the title, if you wish, Poetry List. Poetry list. Wise, wisewoodcarver at gmail.com. We'll have it written here if you like links. And uh, if your pencil's not handy. <laughs> and, um, and, and the yeah. book. And, and well, we're going to have, we're going to have the link for the book as well. And yeah. uh, so we were just at the last minute, we were saying that you might even be available if people want to contact you one-on-one -on -one or as a, as a couple, if people wanted to have some kind of coaching or like if, if they wish they had an uncle like you or an uncle, oh, we don't have to call you an uncle. If they wish they had access to like a, a, a wise, comforting wise person, man, yes. a wise, comforting man like you, 
that you'd even let people contact you individually and have like some coaching? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm I'm open to leave whatever I can in the world if I can make it if I can make a difference in terms of anybody's life, good or bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready to do that. That's that's my 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 mission in life now. Oh my goodness! So if if you if you wish you had a mayor in your life, <laughs> right? He's available. <laughs> Just give me a call. Yeah. Well, or give me an email and then email. you guys will get in touch with each other and you'll figure out, you know, what would you ask Mayor? What would you want him to say? What What would you be curious about? What would you ask him? What would you want him to tell you about you? Which life issues are you going through that you said, I, I wish my so-and-so was here to give me advice. Well, if your so-and-so isn't there to give you advice, um, uh, Mayor is. And we're lucky to have him. So thank you so much. It's been You're so welcome. fun. <laughs> And uh, oh, <laughs> and we will talk with you guys all soon. Thank you so much for being part of the Body Aware Living community and podcast. And best wishes to you, Margot Rose.